So um, I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, large deviation theory for the entropy production rate in one of the simplest active matter systems we know about, uh, active Brownian particles. Um, so I'll uh, define this in terms of active work and um, uh, present a sort of overview which connects the uh, large deviations of uh, this particular quantity, although the, the setting is, is more general, one could think about large deviations of other quantities, uh, firstly in terms of non-equilibrium phase transitions, but also this idea of uh, system design, reverse engineering a system to create certain outcomes. And uh, so I'll give a, a, a number of results for that, mostly based on numerics. And um, uh, I, I will draw attention to the fact that this is quite painstaking to undertake these studies numerically. So what I want to do um, in the final part of the talk is report some very recent work um, by primarily by Tal Agronov, uh, with some help from myself and Rob Jack, uh, which basically addresses the same program in a, a particular model where it's possible to make an enormous amount of progress analytically. And I think the, the, the problem is sufficiently complicated that having a kind of reference model where you can really uh, sort out what's happening uh, is a, 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 a big advantage when one comes to discuss some of the complexities that we'll get onto later in the talk. Um, so um, this is a movie of motility induced phase separation, a well-known phenomenon. Uh, in, we have active Brownian particles here, which I'll define in a second, phase separation, as you see there. So, uh, and with the what, by now well-known, but otherwise unusual feature that the particle interactions are purely repulsive. So in active systems, you can get phase separation uh, uh, under purely repulsive conditions. Um, most of the talk today, though, I'll actually be focusing on the large deviation theory in the regime where the system would normally be uniform. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is this motility induced phase separation will be lurking in the background uh, the whole time. So uh, just to define or remind you what active Brownian particles are, um, each particle has a, a, a directional unit vector living on it in two dimensions for simplicity, we call that U. Um, its angle undergoes Brownian rotation. Uh, if you like, then that defines uh, a, a that, that U defines a direction along which the particle is being pushed. And then uh, there's, uh, thermal noise, the usual diffusive noise in the equation of motion for the particle coordinates R dot I and uh, a mobility times a force. And that force is typically coming from some kind of interparticle pair potential. So the important case uh, uh, fact about active Brownian particles, okay, so they have this uh, driven character. Um, uh, the uh, interactions that are present are pairwise, central, repulsive, and crucially non-aligning in the sense that the angular coordinates of different particles are completely independent. That's what active Brownian particles have got. So unlike, for instance, flocking models, there's no tendency for these U vectors to point in the same direction for any reason. Um, and that's why the, 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 the phase separation, uh, the, the, the phase transitions that you get in the unbiased or equilibrium or, or uh, normal uh, steady state dynamics is to phase separation uh, rather than orientation. Um, so it's easy to uh, define a, a microscopic uh, entropy production rate, um, more commonly called in this context active work. And so uh, one could possibly think of other entropy production rates, but this is the one I'm going to think about uh, today. So uh, this basically looks at the, the, the forcing term, which has a magnitude V. So the, uh, the, the active force is V naught U. And if you integrate that against the particle displacement, you get the work done by the active forces. Uh, time T, there's a long time interval, big T, sum over particles, and to make something which uh, scales between zero and one, divide by uh, the time interval, number of particles times the magnitude V naught, of the forcing. So the app gives me a, a, a dimensionless quantity W. And the case W equals one 
can only arise if each particle is is free to move in direct response to the active force, the V0 term. So uh, that requires no collisions. So that's completely free motion, and you'll only see that at very low densities. If, in, on the other hand, all the particles are stationary in some kind of jam state, then uh, the uh, this entropy production is zero because there's no work being done by the active forces. So it's a, slightly counterintuitive at first that the large entropy production is the zero collision case and a highly collisional system has no entropy production. So um, just to remind you a bit about large deviation theory. Uh, so the typical dynamics of active Brownian particles with repulsions is uh, low densities, it's a homogeneous, low densities and small uh, propulsion velocities V, it's a homogeneous phase, large densities and large propulsion velocities, it's uh, MIPS. Um, and in those two phases, this quantity W is large and small, respectively, it's that way around. But what large deviation theory does is it says, well, okay, choose a density uh, and a, a, a propulsion uh, speed V naught, um, and ask what is the atypical dynamics at those parameters. In other words, we look for trajectories of the system where uh, a, a parameter, in this case, the entropy production, is systematically larger or smaller than usual for indefinitely long periods of time t. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but it's, it's like asking the question, what is the probability of a fair coin coming up heads two thirds of the time forever? And uh, this is uh, characterized by exponential unlikeliness. Um, and that exponential, which you see there for the, the probability of, of observing the sustained uh, wrong value of the entropy production or any other quantity uh, is characterized by the rate function, I of nu. And this is zero in the typical dynamics and it's positive for the atypical dynamics, which is of interest to me today. So we choose, as I said, this, uh, as our um, object of interest, the entry production, but obviously large deviation theory can be applied to any observable we want. So just to um, frame this a little bit, if you think about the Langevin equation for a single overdamped particle, there it is, x dot is mobility times some force plus a noise term with the diffusion constant in it, say in one dimension, um, then you can construct the path weights for that, with, which defines an action a, as written down in the middle of that slide, which in this case is a quadratic form, as for a simple uh, Langevin equation of that type. Um, and uh, the, the, there's some mean value to this action uh, in, uh, if I just average it over all paths. But if I look at uh, what I mean by typical and large deviations, typical paths have uh, uh, hmm. is someone trying to interrupt. Yep. Yeah, Mike. So, so uh, maybe you, uh, you have already mentioned, I missed it. So what is the random variable here? The, so that, that is the active work, right? That you defined. This, uh, this, I'm giving an example here, which is not active work. This is just talking about large deviation theory. The, no, the, in, the, the, in the previous this, slide. Do you want me to go to the previous slide? In, uh, previous slide. This W is the active work, is it? Or yes. Not? So that is the random variable. Uh, well, it's um, the thing that I want. Uh, well, I mean, there are lots of random variables. I've got uh, n active Brownian particles, so their their coordinates are random variables. Mm. But the one that I want to find untyp untypical values of is the active work summed over all the particles. Yes. So this, in the definition of active work, you have summed over the particle and the that's and here, average, the right? Uh, well, okay. there's no average. Uh, oh, okay, there is not. It's a time integral. Okay. It's kind of important not to average that because I want to know how likely it is to be very wet, far from its average. Okay. Okay. So you take different different time interval like t is zero to t, then t to two t, and then you get these w's in different. Well, actually, I prefer to think of zero to t as fixed, but I have an ensemble of paths which are generated by different realizations of the noise. Oh. Okay. Okay. So that's okay. the set of trajectories I'm thinking of. And then it's a matter of looking within that set of trajectories at ones which are not close to the typical behavior. Okay. Okay, okay sure. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so these typical paths are characterized by um, fluctuations in this action about its mean value, which scale sublinearly in time. And the large deviation paths are one, ones where the action is different from its mean value by an amount which increases linearly with, with the long time interval. Okay, so I've said all that's on this slide so far already. I'm looking at uh, how unlikely is a consistently atypical value of the active work. And I'm interested in this rate function defined that way for nu equals w. So there are two ways to address this. One is to uh, just, um, I have this ensemble of paths defined as uh, just explained, and I can just filter them by uh, the, I just choose from that ensemble the ones with the correct uh, new value. Uh, so those are pathways just conditioned on the given mu. Uh, or I can do basically via Lagrange multiplier, I can introduce a bias field, which is called S conjugate to nu, um, uh, and construct this ensemble, which has this exponential reweighting via S times nu. So under quite broad conditions, it is known that the filtered and the tilted ensembles are equivalent uh, uh, at large times. This is similar to the equivalence between microcanonical and canonical ensembles in equilibrium thermodynamics. Um, and you can, you can sample the, the, the tilted ensemble numerically by something called the cloning algorithm, which basically uh, gives you this exponential bias towards a chosen value of uh, new, in this case, the active work, uh, by uh, replicating, making copies of the system, uh, the, the ones which, if you like, satisfy your constraint. So I won't say much about this, except to say that the cloning algorithm uh, I can think of as Langevin dynamics with a certain time step on M samples. Uh, every once in a while, I look at the increments of the uh, biased quantity here, the active work since I last had a look, and then for each member create exponentially uh, uh, large numbers of extra offspring or weighted by that exponential factor. And then I randomly execute members of this uh, multiplied ensemble until I have the same number overall as I had before. So that uh, algorithm is quite painful to do numerically. Um, it generates lots of data, which you then throw away, um, but it can be done and it samples the uh, tilted ensemble. So let's return to the active Brownian particles. Uh, I'm just showing you the unbiased dynamics here. Uh, on the left is actually an experiment. There's a color coding, which is uh, giving colors to different uh, propulsion directions. On the right is uh, the actual, uh, an active Brownian system at fairly high density. Uh, and you can maybe just see, see the arrows, but the colors are also telling you the, the, the direction of the swimming. So we're in a regime here, which is not MIPS, it's homogeneous uh, and it has, inevitably no orientational order because there is no orientational coupling between the particles. So um, the question of, you know, what is the uh, bias dynamics uh, date that was first addressed in this uh, paper by Canetta et al. 2017, we looked at in 2019 and again in, uh, last year. Um, so let's see if I can get this movie going. So if you bias to small w, that means active work not being able to move the particles effectively, so low entropy production in that sense, what you get is MIPS where you wouldn't have expected MIPS. So the homogeneous system, you can induce the MIPS transition by biasing to small values of the active work. Um, if I bias to large values, that's biasing to reduce the collisions, then you see that I get long range polar order, that's the system on the right. So it's important that there's no angular interactions in, the, in this model, but once I filter to make sure that there are a reduced number of collisions, I find alignment as if there were angular interactions to make neighboring particles want to line up. Um, so from the cloning method, or indeed there are indeed other methods of sampling the tilted ensemble, but uh, you can uh, get uh, numerical data on the rate function. So, um, uh, well, uh, the, I've already told you what happens. You see the collective motion phase, so-called CM, at uh, large W. That's for negative bias parameter S. That's on the right of this plot. That's this kind of nomadic looking state. Uh, if I uh, bias towards atypically small 
uh, uh, w, as I said, you get a phase separated arrest, which is essentially a kind of MIPS. But if you look at this plot, uh, you can see uh, n is the number of particles. I mean, it only goes up to n equals 64. If you look on the left hand side, you can see that we're nowhere near uh, convergence there. So the cloning algorithm is, is very useful, but it's, it's quite difficult to get any kind of detail if you're interested, for instance, in the specifics of uh, non-equilibrium transitions and singularities that arise in the rate function i. Um, so let me um, just say something now about how we can uh, make progress with this. And this involves um, looking at bounds on the rate function. But first, I want to talk about something um, connected with this slightly separate agenda of um, uh, um, uh, system design. So uh, that, to do that, I'll introduce something called the driven process, which many of you will know about. It's what, the driven process is by definition, whatever the tilted ensemble does. Uh, and you can sample the tilted ensemble by the cloning algorithm, but you don't need the cloning al algorithm in principle. In other words, the dynamics that you get in the biased process has still got a Langevin equation. I don't have to create new systems and delete them. However, this may be complicated. Um, what it does, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, is that it minimizes the relative entropy uh, to the unbiased case under the constraint of achieving uh, the required atypical value of new, in this case, the active work. So you can think of it as, a, 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 as some kind of dynamical maximum entropy uh, uh, method, which basically tells you the most likely dynamics given that you have this an atypical value of a parameter such as the active work. And it minimizes uh, the tilted action as written down here. Um, so the process which does this is also called the optimal control process in large parts of the literature. So I want to make this connection to designing systems now. So there's a naive idea, which is very simple. And that is, if you start with the unbiased system, so active branding particles as a design, and then I actually want to achieve some, some goal, which is you know, quite a lot of the thinking behind active particle systems is of this type, that you hoping that by making particles active, you can get them to do useful things for you. So the goal here is extremely simple in our case, it's to have an untypical entropy production, in other words, for the active forces to do more or less work than usual. Um, so that's very simple as a goal, but then you can say, right, well, you do this and you find out what the driven process is and that's your new design. In other words, I choose my uh, um, design of active particles to realize the driven process for the given value of, of w, w target. And there's obviously a snag here. And that's that if I think back to what I said to you before, there is a Langevin equation for the driven process. So there's something like an interacting particle model um, but in it, uh, there are many body infinite range interactions uh, in general. So in the, uh, the interactions in the driven process are arbitrarily complicated. So that's not a very feasible design, if you like. But what I can do is I can look at what happens in the driven process. So for example, I can look at those movies I showed you earlier, one of which showed alignment of the particles as a way of realizing large w, see how the driven process does it, and then emulate this with simple interactions. Now, that won't be as good as the driven process, but it may get you close to the behavior you want. Um, and actually, this links to a, 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 a related idea uh, in tune with that strategy, which is as a, as a way of estimating rate functions, and that is to construct bounds on the rate functions. And so this is what um, optimal control theory is really about. Um, so if I introduce a simple interaction, such as an alignment interaction, or a pair potential, which is different from the hard, hardcore potential that I started with, um, I can construct bounds on the rate function using these as control forces. So what's written down here is this inequality on the rate function, um, which involves the Kullback Leibler divergence between the path weights 
in the control system, in other words, where I put in my simple forces like extra alignment forces, extra pair potentials, et cetera, and the path weights under the true dynamics. So uh, this means that you can uh, vary the control forces and uh, uh, get uh, bounds on the rate function. So if you think about this for active Brownian particles, the natural uh, interactions to include is in the top line here, I now have a um, control potential, which is angle dependent. So that can give me aligning interactions. So some kind of pair potential typically, but with uh, a dependence on angles. And then in the equation for the um, uh, updating the uh, displacements, I again can have uh, differences in the control potential, but also I can include a, uh, a, a different swim speed, a different propulsive speed V naught from the one the system would have. So that uh, is uh, uh, another way of uh, including interactions that are, are simple enough to deal with, but and then can give me useful bounds on the rates. So uh, you can follow this strategy, and this is done in this uh, paper, 2021 paper by Kater et al. Um, and if we just think about the case for uh, where you might get alignment, so this is um, negative bias, so uh, large active work, low collisions. Um, it, you, there's a, a formula you can, you can see here, which is the um, optimal uh, adjustment to the uh, swim speed. There's a little bit more to it than that, but for the purposes of today's narrative, that's, that's all you need to know. And then you can get an upper bound by introducing uh, a alignment interaction, which is of mean field type. So that's long range, but it's uh, simple. Uh, so I take the global average of the orientation vectors and square it multiplied by G. It's also possible to get a lower bound on the rate function uh, by a, a trick which involves looking at the dynamics for which that is actually uh, is optimal. So um, I don't want to go into that lower bound, but the upper bounds are uh, just basically done by choosing uh, imaginative dynamical schemes to replace the real one and you can get bounds. So that strategy uh, gives you quite good bounds at uh, large bias, so for strongly suppressed, uh, so, uh, strongly suppressed collisions, if you like, strongly increased active work. It uh, doesn't do well for very small bias. So there are two different uh, plots here. The bounds are uh, unsurprisingly either side of the uh, numerically measured uh, rate function, which is in orange. If you look at the inset, you can see, particularly in the plot on the left, that this is, is okay, but getting worse at uh, small deviation w from its uh, typical value. And that's because uh, the system chooses a different strategy there. So if you look at what actually is happening, close for, for, for a weak bias, then uh, if you want to just slightly suppress the collisions, um, it's what the system actually chooses to do is to become more homogeneous than usual. It, it, it irons out the density fluctuations, but it doesn't orient. And then there's a threshold, W star, beyond which there's a non-equilibrium transition from the homogeneous phase to the collective motion phase. And that threshold is visible in the rate function on the left and in the uh, dependence on the right between the uh, active work and the bias parameter. So for small bias, it's homogeneous. Uh, the, 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 the unbiased state is homogeneous. It remains homogeneous for small bias before going into the collective motion phase. And there is, a, there is a transition. But again, if you want to look at the details of that singularity, obviously that's difficult to do with bounds. Uh, and it's also difficult to do numerically. Uh, so, and there's lots more can happen. So other candidate states for the bias dynamics. So phase separation I've talked about. Uh, and generally by phase separation, we usually mean that you have two bulk phases at different densities with a sharp interface between them. You could also have a smoothly modulated phase where you have re uh, a region of higher and lower density, but with an interfacial profile that is of order the system size. Uh, you can have this collective motion phase, which you uh, would get with alignment interactions. You can also have uh, I, 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 any of these um, dense density modulated phase, so either phase separated or smoothly modulated, uh, combined with collective motion, and then what you will get is moving 
patches or bands of higher and lower density. And uh, most of these don't arise anywhere on the phase diagram of the system in the typical dynamics. Collective motion being the most obvious example of that. So this can get complicated. So what I want to do in the uh, final part of my talk is say a bit about this recent work where we uh, essentially can solve this for a limiting case. So this involves a uh, minimalist 1D model of active particles for which it's possible to construct an exact fluctuating hydrodynamics using uh, macroscopic fluctuation theory. So uh, it's an active lattice gas shown here with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, so I have particles on a lattice. Uh, there are two types, left and right moving particles. Uh, each has a, a, a diffusion and that it's uh, an important technical detail that the diffusion process it does not have an exclusion. So particles can uh, pass through each other under diffusion. Uh, there's self-propulsion, so biased hopping in the direction of either left or right, uh, which does have exclusion. And then there's, a, if you like, a tumbling process which reverses the direction of self-propulsion. And uh, if you look there at the diffusion constant, this, the, it's important that the self-propulsion rate scales like one over L, that's always true in these kinds of models if you want the diffusion and the uh, mean motion to be, to be visible together if I take a continuum or a hydrodynamic limit with large L. But it's also important in this case that the reversal rate scales like one over L squared. So this uh, means that all of these processes are equally slow and uh, that's, the way in which you can get an exact hydrodynamic description from this. I should say in the context of active particles, the last assumption about the reversal rate is quotes unrealistic in the sense that you don't expect of order one reversal on crossing the size of the system, which is what this, uh, what this says, either by diffusion or by self-propulsion. But it's this very um, choice that makes the whole system solvable. So um, the, the, the usefulness of the system uh, was realized uh, by uh, Junior Taya and students and others uh, 2018. Uh, they did the hydrodynamics. Um, here are some uh, hydrodynamic equations for a density. So the density is the number of particles uh, uh, per unit volume locally and a polarization, which is the excess of right over left movers. So the density uh, is rate of change is, is the divergence of the current. The polarization has a, a also a polarization current Jm and a, a, a flipping term which involves gamma and uh, m essentially. So in the deterministic limit, uh, in the middle of the slide, you can read the equations for the particle current, for the polarization or magnetization current, and uh, the flip rate. The control parameters in this system are uh, a, a ratio of diffusive and interfacial lengths L. And if I then rescale the system size to be one, this is the, the interfacial, yeah, this is an inter, it's basically an interfacial width parameter. If I have a phase separation, the interface will be of order that width. And then something like the Peclet number, but it's, it's not quite the same thing, um, which in, is, in, involves the ratio of, of uh, a persistence length to diffusive length. So as shown in that um, 2018 paper, here's a phase diagram. Um, so there's a MIPS critical point at a density of 0.75 and Peclet number of four, just a, 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 a normal looking MIPS uh, phase diagram. So this is a, a, an interesting model because it does give you proper MIPS, what you expect, uh, homogeneous phase, phase separated state, uh, despite the, the kind of slightly underhand trick that was played with the flipping rate. So an important piece of progress which Tal Agronov uh, achieved with, uh, on, and you can read this archive paper from last year, is to actually get the action for fluctuations uh, for this uh, interacting particle system. So um, this has two pieces. It's got a bit which is to do with the fluctuations of the currents around their mean values, which is basically a Gaussian, a two by two uh, quadratic action there. Uh, 
So I won't go into the details of what those terms are, but they, they link back to the um, expressions for the deterministic parts of the current in a, a relatively straightforward way. And then there's a contribution which comes from the strict switching term, which if you think of that, it's, it's because it's a, a kind of shot noise type process, you expect something non-linear here and you get it. Uh, so there's this rather complicated uh, looking form for that. But, uh, oh yes, well, the next thing is that we need to think about uh, the what's the entropy production here because we want to bias with it. So you can sum the entropy production the, 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 the kind of microscopic entry productions by looking at each irreversible move. So some of the moves that, they, that are in that uh, uh, dynamics that I defined are reversible, others are not. Um, if you think closely about that, you can figure out what is the, uh, the rate of these irreversible moves and what is the microscopic entropy production in each case in terms of the ratio of forward and backwards probabilities for those moves. So there's an expression for that microscopically, but you can also get uh, the entropy production from the uh, fluctuating hydrodynamic uh, uh, theory in thinking of that in terms of continuous field variables. And that's done by looking at the uh, action evaluated in a trajectory and in its time reversal. And if you do that, you find this uh, quadratic form here, um, which doesn't involve the, um, the flips from left to right movers because those flips are reversible. And interestingly, these are actually the same. So this is a bit unusual. Uh, and most of the time I spend a long time in lectures explaining to people why the macroscopic or informatic entropy production rate is quite different from the microscopic one. But in this model, it has this special feature that the macroscopic description somehow captures all the sources of microscopic irreversibility and these entropy production rates are the same thing. Okay, so let's uh, say just a little bit more about that, this. If I look at the, the way this entropy production scales in this model, I can pull out uh, factors of length, diffusion constant, lambda, and uh, define something called A, which is like a dimensionless entropy production. And I can look at that, uh, its typical behavior as a function of density. And it has this quite simple form here, rho naught one minus rho naught square, which um, I could say more about, but will not. So then uh, the large deviation rate function is found by minimizing the action over all possible trajectories. Um, with now a hard constraint on A, because I have a microscopic expression for A, and I can do that, or indeed a hydrodynamic expression. The simplest case is, of course, to assume that this, this uh, system remains homogeneous, so a state of uh, uniform density rho and possibly uniform magnetization M. So if you do that, you get a function of two variables, the density and the entropy production A, uh, that is shown here. Mike, you have two minutes plus five minutes for questions. Good, thank you. So um, the, the, the typical curve is the very dark, thick black line, which lies along the plane rate function equals zero at the bottom of this uh, cuboid. Uh, note that its shape, it, it, it's, it's, so it lies in that plane, but it has its own convexity, you will notice at large density. It's not, it, 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 or, yeah, it's, it's concavity rather. Um, and also you can see that the rate function is not, is, has concavities uh, uh, for entropy productions that are smaller than typical in this, this region towards the front of this plot. So, what we have to do now, the point is now that we're interested in this as a function of the two variables, density and A, and we want, uh, we have a global constraint on both of those. Uh, we know the global density, and I'm saying we're looking for what's going to happen at fixed a value of A. So I have to do a global minimization of this rate function, which involves finding its convex hull. And this is exactly the same as the problem which I spent years in my early life uh, considering, which is uh, to find the uh, phase equilibria of 
a, a system of known free energy with two conserved densities. So that's an equilibrium fluid with two conserved densities, something like a, a mixture of three, uh, three types of molecule. So you can do this. Uh, let me just go straight to the phase diagram. So you get a phase diagram uh, for this model, which is quite complicated. So I'm only showing it to you here for the limit of a curly L goes to zero. That's the limit where uh, the natural interfacial width in a, in a phase separation is arbitrarily small. You see you have the homogeneous phase, collective motion phase in pink above it, traveling bands to the right, phase separation in blue, SM is the uh, a smoothly modulated phase where I have uh, spatially varying density, but uh, uh, not sharp interfaces. And something which is quite peculiar about this compared to the um, thermodynamic or um, um, phase equilibrium problem for fluids that I just referred to is that within the, uh, below the black solid line here, so within the whole of this spatially modulated phase region, uh, the, the, the rate function is zero uh, found by the convex hull construction. So that means that in that region, uh, if I want to know the details of what's happening, I have to look at what would be subdominant terms in a thermodynamic situation, which are terms of order L, this interfacial width. So gradient contributions dominate. So I won't go into uh, further details about this because I'm out of time, uh, but let me, I'm, I'm gonna skip through a few slides, which I knew I wouldn't be able to show you all of, but let me just cut to the end of this. Um, so, and don't worry about what else is in the slide, but let me just emphasize this, this box here. Very weird scenario, might doubt approximations, but none were made. This is the, the point I want to make here. Um, so this has a complicated phase diagram. If you then look at the finite L case, you get further complications. There are tricritical points. They do very strange things at the MIPS transition. Uh, this is uh, an amazingly rich scenario. And if you know one was working with a convention, say I was doing thermodynamics, and I said, okay, I'm gonna do some mean field theory on this model here, blah, 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 blah. And I came up with a scenario as complicated as this, I would say, well, this is probably all a big artifact. But the point is that this model, which you can rigorously establish these hydrodynamic theory with, and there is no approximation made here. So one of the things that this is showing is that uh, very complicated uh, non-equilibrium phase equilibria are possible uh, under this quite simple system of active Brownian, or in this case, the active lattice gas model with a very simple bias connected with entropy production. Uh, and so, so the large deviation structure, the take home message then is the large deviation structure of uh, the um, entropy production is a, a, a complicated and interesting thing, which um, will take us quite a lot longer to map out in its details. So thank you for your attention and sorry to overrun slightly on the time. Okay, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I think we can take a few questions. Uh, I think there's a question from Ali Barakai. Uh, no. There's one from Sarah. Ah, okay. There's one Hi. from Sarah. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about the um, hydrodynamic, exact hydrodynamic description. And um, in particular, you mentioned that the entropy production rate that you get from the um, stochastic equation and the field model are the same. Uh, hmm. Don't you think that this is because the hydrodynamic uh, model is exact? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, uh, well, there may well be a, a deep connection there, but I could imagine a system where I have some emergent uh, properties at a, at, a, at a certain scale that have uh, an asymptotically exact description, but which doesn't necessarily capture everything microscopic that is underneath. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to think about that question. Um, it may well be connected but I'm not sure that just the fact that there is uh, no, no, a, it's not obvious. <laughs> an, an yeah. exact description means that it, it's uh, capturing this aspect as well. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, um, I agree. And uh, the other question was, um, so you said that the hydrodynamic model is exact. Uh, 
but it still has fluctuations. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. So okay. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's it's uh, what well, if if you there's this um, field of study called macroscopic fluctuation theory, which is uh, to to those of us who, who who are new to it, it's it it can look a bit strange, but what it ends up typically doing is giving you something uh, like a, a model, often a discrete model, where you take the the limits in a certain way and you end up with fluctuating hydrodynamic equations which are then asymptotically correct and because of that they 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 usually take the, they look like a mean field theory with gaussian fluctuation typically so it, what it means is that even though you may be in low dimensions if you have a say something like a kinetic ising model it will have a mean field ising transition uh, with noise, though, okay. So it's quite, it's it's quite a strange way of avoiding the you know the kind of RG type stuff that you would need to do normally at a, at a, at a, a critical point. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I have a very quick question. So when you do this uh, simulation, let's say in the S plane space, and then you need to invert to the W, so you need to do the simulation for various S, right? Uh, in the say you're using cloning, yes. Yeah, so isn't it very expensive, like computationally? First do for several S and then invert to uh, W? Uh, well, it is very expensive. Okay. And it's difficult to do for large systems. And um, yeah, so so it's um, it would be great if there was a much more efficient way mm -hmm. of conditioning the dynamics. But in a sense, uh, that is kind of what all of this stuff about the optimal control and so on is about. It's dealing with the fact that the... Uh, the driven process is actually extraordinarily complicated and so that you're not going to be able to sample it without wasting a lot of information essentially by, uh, uh, well, say, a, a filtering or, or some other strategy like cloning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thanks for your yeah. attention.